그때 자체를 처음으로 방문하는 건데 온라인으로 돼서 좀 아쉽지만은 또 다음에 어, 또 오프라인에서 기회가 생기기를 바라보겠습니다. <웃음> 어, 아 그런데 지금 죄송한데 오늘 저기 학부생 분들도 조금 계신 건가요? 아니면은 대학원생 분들부터 계신 건가요? 아, 아 지금 학부생하고 대학원생들이 다 같이 있는데요. 아 같이. Uh, I'm sorry, I I uh, I think we should speak uh, in English because 아. uh, yes. Okay, so should I then speak in English? Yes. Okay, no problem, no problem. Okay, okay so uh, so I, I have to assume that there are also undergraduate in the audience. Yeah, I think there are two undergraduate ah. students in the list. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So let me then switch to English. Um, okay, <clears throat> so I see. So the title of my talk today is, uh, as written here, the uh, quantum gravity and the universe. Uh, so specifically, uh, I will tell you how the physics of particles and gravity um, are both reflected in a, a geometry probed by strings and based on that, I will address some of the exciting connections between quantum gravity and our universe. So that's the title. Uh, so historically, it all starts from fundamental particles and their interactions, for which there exists a famous theoretical model, the standard model of particle physics. As you all know very well, it is a particular model in the framework of quantum field theory um, encompassing all the observed fundamental uh, matter particles coming in these three families, as well as uh, three of the four fundamental forces, electromagnetic, weak nuclear, and strong nuclear. Uh, furthermore, in order to give masses to all these particles, the model had proposed an extra ingredient, the Higgs particle, which was discovered at CERN uh, seven years ago. It was so much amazing that such a long awaited particle predicted on a theoretical ground was indeed discovered by experiments. The standard model has long been considered a great success. This is not only because of its successful prediction for the Higgs particle. On top of that, uh, numerous theoretical computations in the model were proven to be consistent with the observations to a great precision. Regardless of the success, however, there are some troubles, amongst which is this infamous uh, difficulty, the gravity, uh, when described in a quantum manner, has no room in the standard model at very high energies. Actually, the trouble is not just to do with this particular model, but rather to do with the framework itself. In any case, because the standard model cannot be complete by itself, a potential new physics is expected at some high energy scale. But of course, the sheer complexity of modern particle experiments makes it very hard to find things that you aren't specifically looking for. It would therefore be of great help if we could get any intellectual guide in advance as to what could be the interesting signals to search for. Either for this purpose or for a purely theoretical purpose, the difficulty of fitting gravity into the quantum field theory calls for a completion of the standard model into a new framework. And string theory is the advocated new framework in this context. So what is string theory? It is a, a theory of fundamental strings as opposed to that of fundamental point particles. The claim is that at very high energies, the physics is described in terms of quantum strings while at low energies, we retrieve the effective description in terms of quantum fields. In fact, the notion of an effective physics is not a new concept at all. A classic example would be how the macroscopic thermodynamic description of a gas arises from the microscopic statistical mechanics. In very much the same way, it turns out that an effective quantum field theory description of a particle arises from the microscopic string theory as a quantum mode of the string. Furthermore, uh, different modes lead to different particle species. And the graviton, the mediator of gravity, 
is always one of them. Therefore, in quantum theory of strings, gravity is not something you need to try hard to put into the theory. Rather, it's something that has to be there. And this is one of the uh, biggest advantages of string theory. So before we actually begin, to get you a sort of global picture for the talk in advance, uh, let me already introduce some of these keywords at this very early stage, which I will more carefully describe later on, of course. Firstly, string theory, as already addressed, uh, is a powerful quantum framework that leads at low energy to an ordinary quantum field theory description for gravity, as well as various particles. Then, it so turns out that there arises a vast set of consistent models of string theory to which gravity can fit. This is what is known as the landscape. And a natural question to ask is, can we find our universe uh, in the landscape? The next important keyword is the swampland. As it turns out, there are lots of low energy models to which gravity cannot fit even if they may be looking very innocent. And the vast set of such apparently consistent but eventually incomplete models is what is known as the swampland. So in a sense, the landscape and the swampland are two complementary sets. And a natural question here is, what are the physical criteria distinguishing the landscape from the swampland? To answer this question, I will introduce the notion of quantum gravity constraints as general consistency constraints imposed on general grounds by quantum nature of gravity. By definition, every low energy model in the landscape being a model of quantum gravity must obey these consistency constraints. And it is in this sense that they are the answer to the previous question. Uh, then here is this last key question. What can we learn from string theory about uh, such general constraints, provided that string theory is a quantum framework for gravity? So I have rather suddenly introduced these four keywords. And of course, at this point, I don't expect all of you to have understood them. It's, it's more like I have released a two minute teaser uh, before showing you the actual one hour movie. Uh, and throughout the talk, as promised, I will describe all these notions more carefully. And uh, by the end of the talk, you will hopefully have appreciated what these notions really are and why they can be exciting to some of us. So here is a more specific outline. The talk will naturally split into two parts. Um, part one is about the continuing endeavors to realize our universe as a quantum gravity theory. I will begin with an introduction to the natural idea called string compactifications. I will then discuss some challenges in dealing with a vast landscape and will summarize the state of the art. In part two, I will expand our perspectives to address general constraints of quantum gravity. For motivation, I will carefully define and explain the aforementioned notion of quantum gravity constraints, after which I'll describe how some of those constraints can be realized in string theory. And depending on time, I may end up uh, uh, having to rush in this uh, last bit, but we'll nevertheless try to get you the general idea of the program uh, in general, at least. So uh, let's now begin. <clears throat> okay. Once again, a big advantage of string theory was that uh, it can consistently incorporate quantum gravity Ever since the realization of this cool fact, an active research field has naturally formed, of which aim is to find a learned model of string theory, effectively describing the observed standard model phenomenology, as well as the observed cosmological properties. Such a sub-branch of string theory is typically known as string phenomenology. Uh, and here comes a most important terminology that will recur throughout this talk. I will refer to a, uh, a low energy model of string theory, whether or not it describes the real world physics as a uh, string effective field theory or a string EFT for short. To motivate this term, uh, let's recall this picture that emphasized 
the uh, fundamental nature of strings. Once again, the point was that the high energy theory of strings leads at low energy to an effective description of physics in terms of quantum fields. And that's why we call the ladder uh, description a, a string effective field theory or a string EFT. So please remember this term, string EFT. Uh, this is going to be the term uh, 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 that will be most frequently appearing uh, uh, in this entire talk. <clears throat> now, related to this notion of effectiveness is the number of space-time dimensions. Uh, we tend to believe in the idea of three spatial and one temporal dimensions. However, according to string theory, the world we are living in must have uh, nine plus one dimensions. The mere fact that consistency of the framework determines for you the number of dimensions is already so much amazing, but very unfortunately, the magic number is nine, not three. So how do we deal with this apparent discrepancy? An interesting reconciliation comes along with the idea of uh, compactification, which I will now turn to. The idea is that at low energy, not only do we see a string as a point particle, but we also effectively lose part of the dimensions. For an intuition, here is a two-dimensional cylindrical surface, R1 cross S1. Let's imagine that certain creatures are, are, are living on this surface, but the circle is compact and very small, and the creatures do not have high enough energy to probe this circular direction at all. Then in their eyes, the surface would effectively be seen as uh, a line, R1 instead. In much the same way, the three plus one dimensional world we feel we are living in may actually arise from our 3,1 times some six dimensional compact space X, uh, which our tiny little fundamental strings can probe while we can't ourselves. Uh, in this spirit described, the non-compact R3,1 is often called external and the compact X6 internal. Now we come to the central theme that underlies this talk, or rather uh, uh, underlies most of the string theory research in general. As it turns out, the low energy effective physics in the non-compact external space-time is determined by a choice for the geometry of the compact internal space. This means that uh, different internal geometries would lead to different string EFTs. And string theory as a framework does provide a certain set of precise rules uh, uh, according to which a given string geometry is going to be mapped to the associated effective physics. Later on, depending on time, I may say a bit uh, about some of the beautiful physical structure behind these rules. Uh, but for the time being, in order to first deliver the flavor of the whole program, let me just say that there are certain rules for figuring out the effective physics. <clears throat> Importantly, in this context, we are naturally uh, led to constrain the geometry. Uh, firstly, we should make sure that the internal space X are allowed by strings to begin with. In other words, we ask which X solves the string equation's motion. That is, uh, which X corresponds to a string vacuum. Uh, the next step is to calculate the string EFTs associated to the allowed spaces X. And then we should ask which spaces amongst all the allowed ones actually conform with the observations. Once we obtain the such viable string EFTs at our hand, we would then be uh, ready to seek uh, for, for any, any hints on new physics desirably. So uh, all in all, we impose constraints on geometry in two steps. Firstly, it better be consistent with the string dynamics in general, and next, uh, also with our observed universe as well. So first step first, it turns out uh, under a certain simplifying assumption that X has to be flat in order for the effective physics to be stable and controllable. And that way it's indeed allowed by strings. In a technical term, uh, X should be uh, a, a so-called Calabi-Yau space. 
In fact, challenges already arise at this point uh, uh, in having to deal with such spaces. Uh, while I don't mean to delve into the proper mathematical treatment, let me still give you a very, very short introduction to these spaces. The name comes from these two mathematicians, Kalabi and Yao. Back in the 50s, uh, uh, they came up with a certain precise criterion for a space to be called flat. And later on in 80s, these very famous string theorists realized that such a flatness notion would precisely correspond to allowed string geometries as discussed earlier. However, carefully defining an abstract flatness notion doesn't really help physicists. So let's be more practical and ask the uh, following question. Does there exist such a geometry at all? And yes, there does. This is perhaps the most famous example, sorry, the, the so-called quintic. Uh, the drawing here only, only showed a three-dimensional section, but it indeed had six dimensions. So having an example, an explicit concrete example uh, is a good start. <clears throat> it's not a vacuum set. It's, it's not a null set. At least there are some examples, at least one. Of course, the next practical question is, uh, are there any other such geometries different from this uh, one uh, quintic example? And the answer is once again, yes. In fact, the answer is very much yes. It turns out that there are a lot of Calabial spaces in six dimensions. So over a billion have been constructed by now. And many string theorists are still keeping their mining for new such spaces, hoping to eventually get at a full set if possible at all. So now back to physics. Um, even if there is a unique string theory at high energy, due to the multitude of the allowed geometries, i.e. so many different string vacua, there arise a plethora of string EFTs at low energy. And that huge set is known as the landscape. Now, depending on perspectives, such a vast landscape of string EFTs could be uh, frustration or excitement. And of course, my personal take is the latter. But anyways, this is just what string theory gives us. So once again, the name of the game is the following. We start with an internal geometry X6, in fact, uh, endowed with a certain additional structure of flux, which is something like an electromagnetic flux. Then we use this uh, internal configuration as an input and via certain calculations of compactification, we obtain the corresponding string EFT as an output and we check if it's right. Our real job here is then to build this black box. And I tell you that this isn't easy. Uh, given a geometry takes hours or days to calculate say the particle spectrum, which is one of the simplest properties of a model, uh, not even to mention that a part of the calculations are still unknown how to even perform. Uh, historically, the quest for realistic model building in string theory initiated in 1985. But it took over 20 years for uh, 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 even a single string standard model to appear. Uh, here, as you can see from the footnote, uh, in this talk, the term string standard model will refer to any string EFT in a certain setup with right particle spectrum and right interaction types. Right in that, they agree with those of the standard model. Rather simple criteria, it may seem, but but why did it take so long nevertheless? For several reasons. Firstly, there are too many string geometries to consider. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are over a billion possible internal spaces around. And for each of them, one must in fact also consider lots of extra flux configurations. And this has led to a conservative estimate of uh, a 10 to the 500 vacua. Next, uh, the required computations for each given internal geometry are very complicated. As I also mentioned, uh, difficulties arise both in practice and in principle. Then what makes it worse, uh, even worse, is that 
most geometries typically lead to unrealistic physics already at the level of spectrum and interactions. An estimated success rate is this uh, famous catchphrase, one in a billion. So uh, we can easily end up spending a lot of time and energy getting nothing if we are lacking luck about the starting point. Despite these difficulties, however, uh, people kept giving efforts. And you might wonder why. After all, they had already found a couple of string standard models. However, uh, we call that the criteria so far were only the spectrum and the interaction types. Of course, there is a much longer list of things to be imposed and a string geometry or a string EFT uh, is to be ruled out if any one of these fails. Therefore, it's required to have a large number of good models at a preliminary level. That's because uh, 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 most of them will surely be ruled out in the end upon imposing more final constraints. So where do we stand? Uh, once again, uh, 20 years after the uh, question first arose, there appeared a couple of string center models, but it was via some random guessworks that they could find these models. And that explains why it took so long, 20 years. By now, however, the program has become systematized and the situation has improved significantly. To make the very long story short, we've succeeded in narrowing the huge set of geometries down to order of 100K models. And I should say that such a progress has only been possible with, uh, with the aid of computers. Through many years of collaborative efforts, we succeeded in modularizing various difficult calculations of compact replication, and eventually came up with a computer package to systematically and algorithmically search for realistic string EFTs. So here is how the package works. To begin with, it takes as an input an internal space endowed with a flux. Okay. Then it proceeds to extract the effective physics. Here are the force types and the particle spectrum via certain uh, mathematical calculations. In particular, the meta spectrum is obtained via the, uh, the geometric quantity known as the cohomology, which is notoriously difficult to compute by hands, but which can uh, now efficiently uh, 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 be computed, uh, for example, using this package. So uh, where can we head to from here? Um, one is to develop a new paradigm. I have already told you that the number of string theory vacua is over 10 to the 500. It's a big data. So string theorists have recently started discussing, in fact, rather seriously, if some of the machine learning techniques used in many different areas of science and industry could also be applied to string phenomenology. In fact, it's less than four year old by now, but lots of interesting results already start coming out in the spirit of this new paradigm. An especially important question in the context of string phenol would then be uh, if AI could distinguish string summer models from the vast landscape of consistent string EFTs. Another direction to pursue is then to, to tackle some of the unsolved problems. Uh, I won't delve into the detailed description of each problem, but just to only briefly mention them in turn, uh, firstly, computational tools need to be developed for extracting detailed physical properties of the string EFTs or string standard models beyond the spectrum and the interaction types. Secondly, one needs to understand how to get rid of some unwanted structures, uh, which happen to be ubiquitous in string theories, uh, EFTs, unfortunately. And last but not least, string standard models should be made compatible also with the cosmology of accelerating universe. So lots to do. And that's the end of part one. Now, I will switch gears to move on to a recent novel take on the string, string phenol program. Uh, this is in fact the main approach I myself have been taking for the past uh, few years. And uh, for the rest of the talk, I will try to share my, my, my recent excitement with you on, on this novel direction of string tube research. So the idea is that study of general string EFTs 
whether phenomenologically viable or not, uh, will teach us about the mysterious quantum nature of gravity. To clarify what I mean by this, um, let me begin by motivating the notion of quantum gravity constraints once again. But before we get there, let's first recall this important notion of the string landscape as addressed in part one. So at very high energy, we have the quantum gravity, which for the purpose of this talk is string theory. And this is a very constrained theory a point in the space of all possible theories at very high energy. But by the time you flow down into very low energies, this unique theory on the top uh, gives rise to a vast set of string EFTs, the landscape. The idea was that the single theory at high energy has a lot of solutions, so many different vacua, as manifested by the multitude of possible internal geometries. And for each of these vacua, we have a different low energy physics. So uh, uh, that's how we end up with this vast set of landscape. And all theories in this landscape set uh, uh, have an ultraviolet completion into quantum gravity by construction, if you, if you, if you, if you run the logic backwards. However, uh, as it turns out, there are many apparently consistent low energy quantum field theory models that nonetheless cannot be completed into quantum gravity at high energies. And the set of such incomplete theories is called the swampland. So within the space of all apparently consistent low energy theories, there are theories in the landscape uh, 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 which can complete into string theory and those in the swampland which cannot. This is a very sharp picture one can have, but it's kind of useless unless we can really understand what are the practical criteria with which one can differentiate a theory in the landscape from, from one in the swampland. In this context, uh, uh, quantum gravity constraints is a general term that refers to any consistency constraints that quantum gravity imposes on general grounds. Then when we are given a low energy quantum field theory model, we can test if the, the specific theory obeys those constraints. And if it fails any of them, then we put it into the swampland. So uh, determining what these quantum gravity constraints uh, uh, are, uh, is going to be the, the, the goal of the recent Swampland program. Um, I must emphasize that this program is not only for academic curiosity. In fact, on the very contrary, this is the kind of program that can in principle get us intellectual guides for possible new physics. So what do I mean by this? Obviously our universe the physical theory of our universe must sit in the landscape. Then um, any innocent, at least innocent looking new physics ideas, uh, uh, which uh, nonetheless contradict any of these uh, quantum gravity constraints should, should, should never work because if they did work, then our universe would be put into the swampland. So they are ruled out. And this is the sense in which the Swampland program can connect to our universe as a quantum gravity theory. Um, note that the word believed here uh, has been inserted. This is to emphasize that the constraints are in fact conjectures. They are not theorems. And I will elaborate on this conjecture aspect later on in an example. So all of this has still been rather abstract and you may still wonder why it's worth studying quantum gravity constraints. To make it more concrete, I brought a, a few prototypical examples of such constraints, uh, but maybe for the uh, sake of time, uh, I will perhaps discuss just a couple of them. <clears throat> the first example is the so-called weak gravity conjecture. Uh, we consider a theory of gravity and electromagnetism 
the two interactions are described in the action by the uh, Einstein-Hilbert term and the uh, Maxwell kinetic term. Here, MP is the Planck mass, of which square is the inverse uh, of Newton's constant, roughly. And the small g here is the electric coupling. Then in this situation, the weak gravity conjecture claims that you need to actually supplement this theory, dot, 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 here, with a charged particle whose mass m is smaller than the charge q in this sense that gravity is weaker than the electric force. Uh, perhaps this is not counterintuitive to the earthlings like us. Uh, as we all learned from high school, uh, gravity is the weakest of the four forces in our nature. And of course, this inequality is satisfied, for example, by the, the, the electron. Then, uh, uh, yeah, because the theory of our universe must sit in the landscape, it better satisfy all quantum gravity conjectures, and in particular, the weak gravity conjecture as it does. This original form of the weak gravity conjecture was later on strengthened to this bolder conjecture, which claims that, in fact, you need to supplement the theory not just with one particle, but with an infinite tower of such a weak gravity particles, so to speak. And the mass scale M0 uh, for such a tower is claimed to sit at uh, the M Planck times the electric coupling G. So what this means is that there is such a particle at mass M0, 2M0, 3M0, and so on and so forth. It's a tower which really becomes infinite if you crank the electric coupling down to zero. So this is the weak gravity conjecture. This is interesting uh, because according to this conjecture constraint, if you have an electromagnetic theory with gravity, you must expect a certain particle or a tower of particles before you reach a certain energy scale M0. <clears throat> and, and this is a strong hint for new physics, of course. Alternatively, if the theory did not exhibit any such particles, then we would put the theory into the swampland. And in this sense, it's a useful constraint. Now, why do we believe in such a strong conjecture? Uh, recently, there has been some pieces of strong evidence from string theory, but the original motivation uh, in this original work came from a, a general quantum gravity intuition without relying at all on string theory. The intuition is that black holes must decay to a smaller black hole emitting a particle. The Einstein-Maxwell theory has lots of black hole solutions, some of which are known as an extremal black hole solution. The latter is called extremal in that the maximal charge uh, 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 is assigned to the solution for a given mass of the black hole. Then in order for such an extremal black hole to decay, one can easily deduce that the emitted particle uh, uh, in this decay process must have mass smaller than the charge. We won't go through the detailed algebra here, but just to point out what is debatable, in fact, it's not completely clear if the intuition about the extremal black holes having to decay uh, uh, is kosher. This part remains as heuristics, and therefore the weak gravity conjecture is still a conjecture. The second example I brought is the so-called distance uh, conjecture. Just like the weak gravity in its strong form, it claims that a tower, a tower of particles uh, uh, satisfying a certain well-defined property must be part of the spectrum. Uh, however, for the sake of time, we will skip over this example. And here is uh, the third example, <coughs> uh, which I will be uh, brief about as well. It's a constraint known as the DS conjecture. This says that in any string EFT, the potential energy of the scalar fields must satisfy this inequality, which is in fact a very strong claim. An immediate consequence of this claim, if true, is that no stable solutions exist for uh, an accelerating universe in string theory. Striking, 
and people were striked when this conjecture first came out. At the moment, this conjecture is considered to have little evidence, at least uh, when compared with many other conjectures in the literature. Uh, nevertheless, if you choose to believe in it, then you might say that our accelerating universe as a string, string theory EFT is not going to be a stable vacuum. <clears throat> okay. So um, having seen a few examples of quantum gravity constraints by now, we now know that they are conjectural constraints. So uh, uh, although it's interesting, of course, to study their physical implication, one would at the same time want to make sure that they are valid to begin with. In general, the evidence comes largely in two types. The first is based on general quantum gravity physics, such as black hole decay phenomena, like we saw in the weak gravity case. Therefore, evidence of this type applies in a model independent fashion, regardless, for instance, of the theoretical framework, the particular theoretical framework the model is described by. Uh, but it tends to be heuristics. On the other hand, the second is based on actual calculations for a given string EFT. The argument of this letter type is precise and quantitative, but, but it tends to be model dependent. What you do is to explicitly test the conjecture uh, for a, a specific theory of your interest, if you can ever do the required hard computations for their particular theory. Um, traditionally, a quantum gravity constraint tends to come from the formal type evidence. And then once a conjecture is out, then string theorists try to test it out to accumulate evidence. Uh, however, not everyone has to follow the tradition. If one may start instead from the second type evidence, which would be a string intuition, and could reversely uh, develop a quantum gravity intuition, it would be an invaluable asset. So for this kind of reverse approach to work, one would of course need to judge very carefully if the test-based evidence is reliable. Well, if a new quantum gravity conjecture was suggested just because it worked for a couple of string EFTs, it would not be convincing at all. Therefore, one needs to take a, a highly model independent approach. <clears throat> um, so whichever direction one ends up taking, Right at this point, lots of string theorists are working very hard to address various quantum gravity constraints in string theory. And unfortunately, I do not have time to discuss each of these works in detail, uh, but I will at least uh, uh, briefly address a novel approach, which can be thought of as uh, uh, being distinguished from the others, in that it has a strong model independent flavor. In other words, our evidence will apply not just to a randomly chosen single string EFT, but in fact, to a whole class of theories in a universal manner. Um, so to be specific, here are four quantum gravity constraints. The first constraint is something we have discussed uh, to some extent, the weak gravity conjecture. The second is the, the distance conjecture, which we have also briefly looked at. The third, is the so-called completeness, uh, completeness conjecture, which says that a, a Maxwell theory <clears throat> must be supplemented by a lattice amount of charged particles, at least one at each part char charge value in the lattice. So uh, even if you don't think deeply about what these three constraints are or what they mean, there is an obvious a common feature which is that a, a tower or lattice amount of particles are predicted. As such, there are very strong constraints and also it's very difficult to have any low energy intuition. However, because they are non-trivial, they are very meaningful and exciting as well, especially when we have little clue for a true UV complete description of our, our universe. <clears throat> And the last constraint here in the list is known as no global symmetry, which we can interpret as saying that something goes wrong when we dial the electric coupling to zero. Well, it's just that we imagine a theory with a very, very weak electric force, then why would it be bad? Again, difficult to understand 
uh, from a low-energy perspective. Now, uh, uh, we are interested in seeing if and how each of these conjectures is realized in string theory. And for this purpose, uh, uh, let's say we try to violate the, the last conjecture uh, in a given string EFT, and then see what happens. Specifically, uh, by appropriately deforming the string geometry, we deform the effective physics in such a way that the electric coupling does tend to zero with the Planck mass kept fixed. Then what we will find about such limits is that a particle tower uh, obeying each of the specific criteria must indeed arise necessarily in this situation in an intriguingly universal fashion. Uh, as it turns out, at the core of this string realization is a beautiful geometric interplay between the dynamics of different forces, in this case, the gravity and the electric force. Because both the gravity and the, the electric force are determined by a given single string geometry, uh, it's natural to expect a certain intricate inter interplay is there. And we will indeed see that uh, the prediction for such and such particles uh, can be understood at a quantitative level from the geometry of the, the internal space X. And uh, what's especially interesting is that the argument is valid as long as the space X is allowed by strings. And therefore, it can be considered a model independent test of this, these conjectured constraints. Um, specifically, we analyzed the, the cases where the dimension of the internal space X is either a four or a six. So accordingly, where the external space time dimension can range from four to uh, five and six. Uh, and then uh, we confirmed that the aforementioned quantum gravity constraints are fulfilled in the resulting string EFTs in these various dimensions via a certain universal microscopic mechanism. So in, in the remaining maybe uh, 10 minutes or yeah, 10, 10 minutes or so, I will try to get you uh, the flavor of this stringy mechanism before concluding the talk. Uh, so for concreteness, I will assume that the, the internal space uh, X is of dimension six so that we can discuss uh, four dimensional space time physics uh, at low energy. <clears throat> so uh, this is going to be the most technical and uh, uh, the most dense slide in my entire talk, but in fact also the second last slide as well. So uh, if you could bear with me for maybe uh, five minutes or so, I will try to convey the general ideas through uh, a bit of details. To this end, uh, let me first tell you the precise manner in which the strength is of gravity uh, and the strength, strength of electric force uh, are determined by the internal geometry. So the former strength, the, the gravity strength is given as the size of the entire internal space X6. And uh, the, the ladder is inversely proportional to the size of a certain uh, four dimensional subspace S4 sitting inside X6. And of course, there is a reason behind these behaviors, but, but here we will just use them as a fact of life. <clears throat> then, as I said earlier, here is what we're gonna do. We, we, we will deform the geometry in such a way that the, the coupling, the electric coupling G becomes very small while gravity, the M Planck is kept fixed. And we will ask what happens to the effective physics. In terms of geometry, what we have to do is we stretch S4 in a fixed volume X6, because uh, if we stretch S4, then the coupling will go to uh, zero. But if we keep the X6 volume fixed, then the gravity strength will be kept fixed along the way. Now, this is a purely geometric question. And uh, 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 to this uh, geometric question, our answer is that uh, a certain 
two-dimensional surface C2 must shrink inside the uh, internal space X6. Why? A, a rough intuition is as follows. So imagine uh, deforming a fixed area rectangle. And obviously, if one direction is to be very big, the horizontal direction here, then its normal direction, the vertical one here, should be very small. And in a sense, our statement is a, a generalization of this simple fact, but I won't get into the details of this geometry argument. So that's enough about geometry, I guess. Now we will be addressing the consequence in physics. Okay, so as it turns out, string theory has not only a one dimensional uh, stringy object, but also a three dimensional extended, more extended object called a D3 brain. Now, such a D3 brain can internally wrap uh, around this uh, uh, shrinking internal surface C2 in the limit. And this will effectively lead to a string in the external space time. This is because the two uh, out of the three spatial dimensions of a D3 brain are not going to be visible anymore, given that they are wrapping an internal small uh, 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 C2. Uh, uh, and only at low energy, we only see the effective stringy part of the three-dimensional object. Then the tension of such an effective string at low energy is proportional to the size of the wrapped object, sorry, wrapped object C2. This should be intuitively clear. Uh, for instance, uh, stretching a rubber band costs energy and makes it very tensionable if you just stretch it. And it it's, it's a very similar dynamics here. Uh, you wrap some object with a brainy object and if the wrapped object is very large, then it costs energy. Uh, uh, and, and in other words, if it's very small, it, it costs very, very, very little energy. So the tension goes to zero. And therefore, uh, because the tension of such an effective string goes to zero, its, its quantum excitations will also become very light. And this furnishes a light particle tower. And if you carefully quantitatively analyze this tower using some string theory techniques, uh, you can then confirm that this tower contains particles that, that obey the specific properties required by the various quantum gravity constraints. And, and, and this we claim is the microscoping mechanism by which string theory realizes the, the quantum gravity constraints. <clears throat> so uh, finally, uh, we get to the outlook. Uh, I will perhaps very quickly flash through. So I brought uh, two directions. Um, well, one could of course try testing if the proposed mechanism works uh, in even more general situations. Uh, so I, I haven't told you about the detailed setup of our string theory compactifications, but uh, maybe also here, because it's a bit technical, I won't discuss the details of uh, uh, this precise generalization we are, we are trying to uh, uh, aim at. But perhaps more interesting and more ambitious is this uh, second direction. Uh, we would eventually want to develop a novel quantum gravity intuition by studying the general features of string EFT. So we start from studying general features or uh, common to all string EFTs. And then from there, we try to develop some quantum gravity intuition. So for instance, uh, uh, given that one and the same microscopic stringy origin is at the heart of multiple quantum gravity constraints, it is very natural to ask if other meaningful constraints can follow at all from the same microscopic origin. Uh, then finding an answer to such a question will eventually help us hopefully uh, better understand some of the mysterious quantum nature of gravity itself. <clears throat> so, uh, okay, so on that positive note, let me summarize the entire talk. So, uh, String compactification describes an effective three plus one dimensional physics of the nine plus one dimensional string theory. Uh, 
this turns the question of which physics into that of which geometry. However, it's not easy to come up with a, a truly realistic string model, partly because a, a vast landscape of string EFTs arises from a plethora of possible internal configurations. While very difficult, uh, one of the virtues of such a string phenol program is that imposing phenol constraints on string geometries will give us insights into new physics. Um, in the second part, the scope of string phenol program has expanded to the study of general string EFTs. And um, I have illustrated how some of the general quantum gravity constraints uh, could be universally realized in string geometry. Uh, one of the visions of this swampland program is that uh, better understanding characteristic features of string EFTs will also give us insights into new physics. So all in all, there exist intimate connections amongst string geometry, uh, particle phenomenology, and quantum gravity physics. And obviously, there is much more work to be done. So please stay tuned. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, very, yeah, thank you very much for your nice overview talk. And do you have any questions, audience? Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so, so we, I mean, the <coughs> weak gravity conjecture uh, is based on certain gauge symmetry in, in the low energy, for instance, U1 factor. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, what if? The gauge symmetry is broken at some scale, and in the low energy, you see only uh, only one unbroken symmetry. And then uh, my question is: uh, you are still in the effective field theory with the only only one one factor, but you may see you, you may start seeing additional gauge symmetries in the high energy. And then my question is whether um, you can think of UV completion of very small coupling in the low energy. Uh, but uh, you can see all the um, sizable coupling, couplings in the UV, UV. For instance, in the clockwork theory, uh, it's kind of an effective theory description uh, of the small couplings. Uh, but the based on many uh, copies uh, of the same symmetries, multiple copies, like uh, if you have a many u ones and so uh, I wonder uh, the U weak gravity conjecture applies to this case or, uh, it, or so, does it depend on the assumption of the symmetries? <laughs> so, so of course the formulation of the conjecture is mm -hmm. based on which, which gauge symmetry you have at a particular mm -hmm. energy, mm -hmm. right? So, yes. uh, so so, you, so you're imagining at low energy, you have a single U1, but at higher energy, you have several. Yes. Right. So I guess, so this, this conjecture applies at a given energy scale. So if at a given low energy scale, if you only had one U1, then you would apply a single U1 version of weak gravity at that scale. Mm -hmm. If you go high, higher in energy, and if you have more U1s, then there you'd want to apply a multiple U1 version of the gravity there. Mm -hmm. But because the because the uh, uh, quantum gravity intuition of the weak gravity is not to do at all with high energy completion, it's just about the low energy theory. Mm -hmm. So I guess this we would expect the weak gravity particles to be around for a single U1 sort of form in the low energy and at a higher energy in, in, a, in a multiple U1 version, I guess. You, you expect that new particle should be lighter than the breaking, the breaking scale. Like let's say if you uh, have a massless U1, I mean the unbroken U1, and then you have a symmetry breaking scale at some point. But I, I roughly, uh, because we have a cutoff, kind of you have a cutoff, uh, yes. because of the breaking symmetry breaking scale at least uh, i think you can expect that there are light particles below that scale but uh, you are making a much more strong 
um, conclusion uh, because the, you have a much lighter particle expected uh, because the, the remaining U1 factor uh, could have very small coupling. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. So indeed. So if you, if in this model, if you do not intend to include such uh, a light, lighter particles at mm -hmm. slightly lower energy than the breaking scale, mm -hmm. then the weak gravity conjecture will tell you that this model is not going to be working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So it is an interesting question, uh, you know, for a particular model such as mm -hmm. clockwork theory. Yeah. yeah, yeah, indeed. So maybe there is some small clash there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, in the in the last uh, your last technical part, the mm -hmm. next to last page, you showed yes. very interesting picture. Uh, oh. How to realize <laughs> weak, gravity, weak gravity conjecture in string theory? Yeah, it's uh, I appreciate it. And the, my question is with uh, uh, you: Is there any question about the uh, stability of shrinking uh, to cycle? I mean. Is this continue to shrink or are you going to stabilize it a small uh, size? Oh, good. So here, uh, okay, so depending on dimensions, but yeah, so, so this is like you are deforming. So in terms of the effective physics, you are, you are going to the regime in the module, you, you are going to the regime in the parameter space where electric coupling goes to zero, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, in six, okay, in, in, okay in, in the context of phi plus one dimensional EFT, for which I have to assume that the internal space is real four dimensional, then there is no such constraint at all in shrinking any of the cycles because for some reason of the uh, supersymmetry reason. However, uh, if you want to discuss three plus one dimensional external physics, uh, in terms of real six dimensional internal space geometry, then you may indeed have to worry whether such a shrinking is allowed by dynamics or not. Mm. And if you go through the analysis for this particular case of, uh, 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 okay, so I, I, I said there is certain two dimensional uh, surface C2 that must shrink inside X6. And I haven't actually described what kind of property this, this, this surface should have. Uh, we have actually come up with the specific properties this, this surface will have. And for this particular type of surface, in fact, we can check that such a shrinking is not obstructed by the dynamics. So mm -hmm. in fact, it's fine, it's fine. You can actually shrink it. Mm -hmm. I see, mm -hmm. okay. But not for every, 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 every surface you can find in the geometry. So there are some surfaces which you cannot shrink uh, because dynamics do not allow for that. Mm -hmm. But in this particular case, it's fine actually in fact. Okay, I see. Well, uh, that, that's somewhat interesting. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you can. Yeah. But in the uh, general relativity, um, we know the Bianchi type solutions. Where the uh, we assume some unisotropic uh, uh, behavior. So uh, one lesson we have is uh, if some direction, some geometry shrinks, yes. then other geometry expands. Yes. So uh, I'm also in the, uh, curious about the, the final state of this shrinking, but you say uh, there is no uh, nothing to prevent this so, shrinking. Right. It's also uh, uh, somewhat worrying. But in addition to that, uh, usually we, uh, in general relativity, we have uh, some, ge if some geometry shrinks, then some geometry expands. So uh, I wonder whether uh, such kind of thing, why that doesn't happen in, in this case, and also, uh, yeah, of course, well, uh, yeah, why such a thing does not happen? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Maybe uh, GM is some specific theory, so it, it, it uh, 
and uh, not allow this uh, one geometry just fixed and the other geometry just uh, shrinks without bound like that. Um, so, sorry, maybe I didn't get the question. Could, could you repeat the last bit? So my question is, uh, you are saying uh, this is not by hand is shrinking tangent. There is some dynamics which determines whether this C2 shrinks or not, oh. like that. So, oh, so, so. Uh, probably this dynamics comes from the fully dimensional tangent theory, or it just by hand. So to realize this weak coupling conjecture. Right. So, so in, in so okay, so from the perspective of uh, effective field theories alone, uh, one can think of uh, arbitrarily tuning whatever parameters as one likes, right? Uh -huh. So that's fine. But uh, you, if there is to be some UV completion of such low energy theories, then uh, it may not be possible to arbitrarily tune the parameters because there can be some in intricate links, right? Between the parameters with some UV origin and uh, from this string theory point of view, these links, uh, these links can be coming from uh, consistency of the geometry, mm -hmm. as well as consistency of these uh, uh, higher energy dynamics. <clears throat> and first of all, what I'm saying is that the, the, for the consistency of the geometry itself, uh, uh, we can take this limit. However, uh, even what I'm saying is even more, even for the consistency of the higher energy uh, 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 level dynamics, this particular uh, uh, direction in the space of parameters is still fine, even dynamically. But it's not to say that uh, every shrinking of an arbitrary cur a surface inside this six dimensional space is allowed. It's not at all like that because some, even if such a shrinking, some arbitrary shrinking is allowed purely geometrically, the dynamics at high energy scale may not allow for that. But for this particular tuning, it is actually allowed. So that is our claim uh, from our analysis of the dynamics at high energy. Um, but what I'm worrying about is uh, if something shrinks to zero size, then yes. the curvature increases. So then uh, probably that's not physical. Uh, zero size and curvature increase. Uh, maybe it's a flat direction. So maybe yeah, that, more exponentially uh, runaway, flat. runaway direction. It, it must be stabilized somehow when uh, supersymmetry symmetry is. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm happy with, with the stabilization if, if that happens, but. Uh, this uh, shrinking without end is somewhat strange. Uh, okay. I guess uh, this is the still, uh, con uh, it's not a com fully com complete picture. Right, it's, so. Uh, we, like, uh, qualitatively, yeah. uh, there is a, such a uh, stingy realization. In principle, right? It's a principle, you have a realization in string theory. But in reality, you need to consider all the modular stabilization and uh, right. Which I have not actually acceptable models, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So yeah, in the end, uh, this issue of modular stabilization has to be addressed as well. But uh, for now, uh, I have not tried uh, uh, bringing these extra ingredients, which might be needed for stabilizing these moduli or the geometric sizes. Uh, and, but even without that, uh, I wanted to see what kind of constraints are to be imposed at low energy. And, and yeah, it, just at this level, I was discussing things indeed. Yeah, I think, yeah. yeah. Maybe I have a, one short question. Uh, so do you have uh, an intuition on the digital space, con this, this uh, conjecture uh, in the context of your shrinking cycle. I, I don't know whether it doesn't mean that our vacuum is unstable and we are in a metastable universe. 
Can you say about so, back energy? So I must say uh, that mm -hmm. this this picture actually I was I was addressing in this talk is from the beginning assuming that the external space time is flat. So I mean, this this picture is perhaps not going to be an appropriate one for for discussing the sitter the sitter conjecture yet. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you try to, in the, I mean, related really, really to the pr previous question, actually, if you, if you try to right. sort of stabilize the moduli and stabilize, I mean, break the supersymmetry and so on and so forth, then in the end, you can, starting from this setup, try to discuss uh, those issues about the sitter. But yeah, I must say that I haven't actually thought about that yet. Um, mm. so it's a very difficult one, but very important one indeed. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Maybe. I, we asked many questions, but uh, if there's a, uh, I don't know, the Yusan, Dr. Zhang, you have a question. Yeah. You can read your oh. discussion. Oh, but, um, I'm sorry. I mean, we can, uh, we cannot say. So, what do you say? Ah, uh, the you can read your discussion. Uh, Maybe okay. you can uh, ask any question from the students. I don't know. Yes, um, actually, currently, I don't see any questions. And so, yeah, we have uh, enough question, I think. So, uh, there is a one more question by Professor Gang. So, yeah, uh, okay. Can you turn off? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, we are, we are in the same room, so. Uh, yeah. okay, I see, I see, I see the problem. <laughs> uh, this is some some uh, minor question, but um, I, I have been very uh, curious about why we do not have the negative mass in gravity. So, the, is there any hints about the non-existence of negative mass in in this kind of program? Um. <laughs> You mentioned some conjectures, some constraints based right. on the special field theory. Right. Um, I have not heard of any conjecture explicitly stating, uh, 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 addressing. So in other words, the full con uh, string theory uh, allows the negative mass state. No, string theory. Actually, no, in, st in string theory, such such objects cannot arise. They are sort of. There, there are some potential negative mass objects, but they are sort of projected out in the end, in string theory at least. But as a general sort of quantum gravity constraint, I'm not sure whether people have been trying to address this um, along this line. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, negative mass is one of the, the easiest way to produce uh, repulsive uh, gravity, repulsive right. force. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, to prevent some uh, uh, the singularity uh, or the collapse without hand, we, we need uh, some repulsive nature of the gravity anyway. I wonder whether uh, at the, the uh, small scale, uh, this uh, negative uh, mass, nature uh, mass, or some some particles with the negative having negative mass, uh, uh, playing very important role at, at that scale. Uh, but all right. Mm. And uh, uh, my another question is, uh, you mentioned that the basic idea is using the, uh, the constraints coming from the quantum gravity, but we do not know the, we do not have the, uh, that theory, the theory of quantum, uh, theory of uh, quantum gravity. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, what about just uh, uh, constraints from classical gravity? I, I'm not sure if, if my question doesn't um, does make sense, but uh, classical gravity doesn't give any constraints. Uh, 
Um, so, well, so many of actually, okay, so um, if, if everything is going to be described classically, then mm -hmm. there can of course be some constraints coming from the uh, particular form of the action, the classical form of the action, I guess, because mm -hmm. that governs the theory and the theory is a particular one, particular law. Mm -hmm. So there can be some constraints also from the form of the action or the general form of the action uh, in a classical manner. How however, uh, those constraints are to be sort of intuitively understood uh, from the classical dynamics, mm -hmm. if there can be any. So well, the, 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 the crucial difference here is that these constraints which uh, originate from the very quantum nature of gravity is not understandable in an intuitive manner. So in that sense, it's a sort of non-trivial constraint that one typically do, does not consider in building some, some, some say, beyond the standard model uh, uh, theory. So, so I mean, I, yeah, I, I have not thought particularly about what kind of general constraints can arise from the classical dynamics of gravity, actually. So there, there can be some interesting things can be, that, that, that can be said from, from that direction as well, but probably those things can be uh, understood sort of intuitively. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, this uh, the, uh, singularity, the formation of the singularity in, in, in gravitational collapse, mm -hmm. maybe, uh, uh, sa saved from the quantum nature, mm -hmm. none but just the classical dynamics. Right, okay. right. Mm -hmm. mm, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, for that was quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, could I make a fun question? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, also, I could not uh, pre understand what Professor, the first, uh, maybe second question of Pro Professor Guang. Uh, and anyway, this is something extension of his question. Then, is it not their mathematical reason that uh, the existence of imaginary math or complex number math? <laughs> Yeah, so that was that was the question. Yeah, by negative, I think uh, we meant uh, math squared to be negative. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, my question was not the imaginary math, the not accounting math. That's already. Uh, ah, sorry, out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, that's right. Ah, uh, 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 right, 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 right. I'm just, it, it's not accounting math. Uh, yeah, of course, yeah. But uh, just negative sign. Ah, yeah, right, right, right. That's what I, what I, yeah, I, indeed, what I indeed, was asking. Talking about repulsive versus attractive, indeed. Ah, yes. Uh, I see. This is anti gravity. Yeah, you are talking about. Yeah, yeah, indeed. indeed. Yeah, I, I was. Anti gravity. Ghost, ghost like uh, graviton. It is yeah, I'm not sure what I can say about <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I, I don't have enough wisdom to share with you about this. Okay, uh, I also think so, because I could not uh, imagine what what the imaginary math means. <laughs> Well, in, in general, relativity, it's simply the, the, the particle moves at the speed of, uh, rather than the, the speed of light. So, uh, the mass could be just positive, but uh, uh, the speed of, of that particle is rather than uh, the speed of light. That's, But there was some uh, brain world scenario uh, in some 20, about 20 years ago, 
if you have a infinite extra dimension, you have a ghost like a scalar particle in the low energy. Mm. Um, so you have anti gravity. So I think the anti gravity comes mm. from the scalar degree of freedom in the low energy. And you can ask a question whether it is in the swampland or in the landscape. And whether, I mean, if it is phenomenologically acceptable, the anti gravity is acceptable in some case, maybe. Uh, it is an interesting question, right? Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The low energy perspective, there, there is my, if there is nothing wrong with that. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. uh, I think yeah, there are many other interesting questions we, we can ask, yeah, but uh, the time is so uh, time is getting late. I don't know. Are there any questions, some comments? Things, yeah, if, you, if, you don't mind, if you don't mind, I was just curious, is there any example uh, for some new particles suggested uh, by the conjectures, like we co we conjecture and this little conjecture. So maybe that is a similar to Hamnes question, but uh, is there some specific example or phenomena to resolve with the, um, with that, the new particle, or is there, um, there is some connected hypothesis or new particle in the particle phenomenology with that, with that particle in the conjecture? So like, uh, for instance, um, uh, you said in the weaker conjecture, mm -hmm. uh, it needs uh, for like particle. Yes. That the charged particle is not, uh, cannot be a matter or in the particle, normal particle phenomenology. So it's then connect Charged that part. in uh, with the normal. Sorry, did you say charged particles are not? Cannot be a dark matter, like. Ah, dark so, matter. So, so it, I, I'm just ah, curious if there's a real example. Yeah. Uh, dark matter. Um, so, good question. Dark matter. Um, okay, at least maybe not from here. Uh, okay. Maybe from other other conjectures like neutral particles, some neutral particles, but a little bit massive. Um, yeah, I, I can't think of any for now. So maybe I'm being useless here. But yeah, uh, yeah, the kind of particles that are typically expected are charged indeed, and also by the distance conjecture, for example. Lots of particles are expected, but at a limiting regime in the model in the parameter space. So this is also not going to be too useful because genetically these particles are not expected uh, to be light. So very good question uh, in connection with the actual uh, dark matter physics, but uh, unfortunately I do not have a clear clear suggestion to to make actually. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Maybe you can uh, you can work on uh, string landscape for dark matter. So dark matter mass scale, we don't know the, what is the dark matter mass and the interaction scales. So <laughs> you can look for the best of, of the landscape for dark matter, and then you can test. Oh, this dark matter is ruled out by string theory. <laughs> and this dark matter, you need to look, look at it. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting feature to develop. <laughs> <laughs> And then, is there any further questions? If not, uh, this time is too over. So, listen, speaker again, and we can stop here. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. 네 이승준 교수님, 박 박사님 감사합니다. 아 초대해 주셔서 또 나중에 뵐게요. 예. 네, 안녕하세요. 네, 경공원 아, 교수님도 계셨습니다. 네, 계속 좀 네. 좋아서 감사합니다. 네. 아, 안녕하세요, 박사님. 이렇게 되었습니다. 아, 어, 안녕하세요, 박사님. 아유, 너무 아, 오랜만입니다. 여기, 네. 여기 또 뭐지? 교수님도 
계시고 발표자 아, 좀 얻을 수 있을까요? 네. 안녕하세요. 네, 안녕하세요. 잘 들었습니다. 예. 네, 감사합니다. 박사님 그 발표자를 좀 얻을 수 있을까요? 예, 올려드릴게요. 네, 네. 아, 예, 예. 네. 제가 다 보내드렸습니다. 아, 아 그러세요. 네. 아, 아. 네. 아마 아, 링크, 네. 링크. 발... 네, 교수님 근데 보내주신 발표자로 자료가 이거랑 조금 다른 것 같아요. 업데이트된 아, 것 같은 게 나누는 것만 없습니다. 용량이 커가지고요. 다 하니까 나눠놓으니까. 아, 아 그런 거. 줄여놨어요. 내용은 똑같은 건가요? 예. 내용은 똑같은 거죠. 